Well, good morning then. I will start uh, today's program. Welcome to the AAA ICDR International Arbitration Program. This is the kickoff program for New York Arbitration Week and we're very pleased you are able to join us from all parts of the world. Uh, my name is Luis Martinez. I'm Vice President for the ICDR. I will be handling the CLE information. West Legal Ed Center is procuring continuing legal education credits on behalf of the American Arbitration Association. This program is available for CLE credits in New York. If you are licensed in a different jurisdiction, you will be able to request a general certificate that you may be able to submit on your own for credit. We do recommend that you verify this with your own jurisdiction. Approximately a week before the program, you will receive an email with instructions to request a CLE certificate from AAA Education Services. Now, this is important. If you would like to receive CLE for attending today's program, please make sure you keep track of the CLE code words that will be provided today. There will be a total of five words interspersed throughout the program, and you'll be required to provide all of these words in order to receive the CLE. The AAA will not be able to provide these words post-program, so it is important that you keep track during the session. And the first code word for today's program is counsel. I repeat, counsel. Let me turn it over to today's moderator, Mr. Eric Tuckman, who is a Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for the AAA ICDR and is also responsible for the international division, the work of the ICDR globally. Eric, the floor is yours, good day. Thank you very much, uh, Lewis, and good morning, uh, afternoon or evening to all of you, depending on where in the world you are. And thank you for attending today's uh, in-house council roundtable, uh, which is being hosted by the AAA ICDR. And uh, given that this is really the kickoff session for New York Arbitration Week, really a full week of outstanding uh, programming that the organizers have put together. Welcome to New York Arbitration Week 2020. Uh, our thanks obviously to the organizers, Stephanie Cohen, Rekha Rengachari, there's many others, uh, but uh, really thank you for taking what would have been a, uh, a program. Of course, it would have been nice to get together in person and uh, making it virtual. It's a lot of work and we appreciate that. Uh, let's hope we'll see you all in person next year uh, in New York. Uh, at the same time, it's really wonderful. Uh, really, the silver lining is that many people from around the world can, uh, can join us and we can get benefit from your presence. Um, so today, uh, we are fortunate. We've got three very experienced in-house counsel uh, that focus on arbitration. And uh, their voice, this voice of in-house counsel, is critically important to the international arbitration process. It's frequently sought out uh, and uh, desired and uh, attempts to incorporate uh, their voice and presence into programs like this, but frankly, it can be a challenge. Um, and so uh, there is a little bit of an underrepresentation of in-house counsel, yet they're the decision makers frequently in terms of whether to include an arbitration clause and also in terms of how the arbitration process proceeds. Um, so our speakers today are Susanna Blades, Associate General Counsel, uh, Commercial Litigation and Arbitration at ConocoPhillips in Houston. Kai Uwe Carl, Global Chief Litigation Counsel at GE Renewable Energy in London. And Michael Martinez, Senior Vice President, Associate General Counsel, uh, Dispute Resolution at Marriott Bonvoy at, in Washington, DC. So a nice geographic representation as well. And again, I, it, it is going to be helpful to understand really how each of today's speakers are involved in the arbitration process, what their experience is. Uh, and obviously, um, I think for those attending, that's helpful in terms of understanding their perspectives and views. Um, so uh, if we can just have each of them just briefly explain what their role is in the legal department, exactly what is done in-house regarding arbitration, mediation, other forms of dispute resolution. And also if their organizations 
have a particular approach to arbitration? Do they universally try to encourage it? Do they universally try not to encourage it uh, and uh, prefer litigation or other means of dispute resolution? Um, so uh, with that, uh, Kai, uh, can we start uh, with you, please? Sure. Um, thanks, Eric. Can you hear me? Just checking whether my mic or Perfect. Yes. Super. All right. You know, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here uh, and participate in this uh, virtual conference. So, look very, very quickly. Uh, your your first question. Um, so, I lead the litigation team for renewable energy. Um, we're a small team. You know, globally handling um, our litigation portfolio or dispute portfolio, I should say. Uh, you know, across the world, we are a um, you know, a company active very much in the construction arena. So you can imagine we have, you know, tons of, of disputes, uh, which is just, you know, I guess, uh, a, 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 a equation of how construction works. Um, we, so in terms of the role of, of, of my team, it is really, you know, we, we take care of the entire portfolio. And then of course it depends on the type of cases. You know, we, of course, pay a lot of attention to the large metals we have. Um, and with the kind of smaller cases, it, it's more um, that we kind of give um, input or support um, the, the regional council we have, um, you know, a, a across the globe. And then if you look into how we work together with outside council, again, it depends very much on the matter. Um, for some cases, you know, we are very much involved hands on um, going as far as, you know, um, handling cases in house. Um, that for us is always kind of a question of how much resources we have and then what kind of case it is. Um, and then for other cases, we take, you know, kind of a more distanced view and just oversee what outside council is, is doing. Um, and it depends on, on the kind of uh, issue we're talking about. For example, mediation is, is, is an arena where I think it's much better done in-house than externally for various reasons. Uh, while, of course, if you look at a court litigation, it's a different, it's a different topic, right? We cannot, uh, there's always a, a certain distance between us and, and a litigation, say, in Nigeria. Uh, we can obviously not, not appear in, in Nigeria in court. Um, and then you, you're maybe just quickly to your second question, whether we have any specific view about including arbitration clauses. I guess that's the famous question, the famous, the famous answer. It depends, right? Um, so, you know, if you ask me about, I don't know, let's say court litigation in Switzerland as compared to arbitration in Switzerland, we probably feel less strong about it. Uh, and we would be willing to, to accept both and probably wouldn't negotiate this very much. On the other hand, if you compare, uh, if, you, if you talk about um, you know, litigation in a country with a less developed judiciary as opposed to international arbitration, we'd have a much stronger view and would try to push the case into, um, into international arbitration for obvious reasons. Um, look, I'll, I'll stop here. I don't want to talk too much. Um, and I hope that um, that was helpful. That is helpful. Thank you. Um... Susanna. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to speak at this um, conference. Um, so I'm Associate General Counsel here at Conoco Phillips. I manage a team of six lawyers and four paralegals, and we handle all commercial disputes uh, around the world. So that includes, you know, typical oil and gas, royalty disputes, environmental disputes, breach of contract, and all the international disputes we have as well. Um, in terms of what we do um, in-house versus what we send out to outside counsel, so we try to do a lot in-house um, and actually uh, mostly on the pre-dispute um, side. Like, so um, we work, we like to be involved early on and work with our transactional lawyers to um, mitigate, let's say, you know, the, the conflict and try to get to a resolution so it doesn't turn into arbitration or litigation. So, and then we do most of the work um, in-house. Um, when the case is filed or we file, like we're claiming or, or respondent, um, we, we always use outside counsel. We don't, don't uh, manage our own, we don't appear in court or in arbitration ourselves because, you know, it's just the volume would be 
very difficult for us to do that. Um, but we remain extremely uh, active. You know, all the outside lawyers that have worked with us know, like we're very hands-on. We attend all hearings, uh, even like procedural hearings, and we don't really let any any letter, any brief, nothing go out without our internal review. And we think it's very important, not because we don't trust our outside counsel, but we believe that's a partnership. And, and we are accountable and we want to be present and involved in all the, the decisions in the case. And in terms of approach, um, arbitration versus litigation um, or mediation, um, for international disputes, we always use arbitration. Um, Except I should say, um, you know, there are some courts, some countries, like for example, UK courts, we'll be totally fine going to um, UK courts. Um, but other than that, pretty much we try to choose arbitration for all of our, our international disputes. Uh, for domestic disputes, it depends. Um, I think we use mostly litigation for those, but you know, some commercial disputes with longstanding uh, partners and that require some confidentiality, then we use arbitration as well, but it's case by case. I mean, the type of contract. Um, in mediation, we try to encourage me mediation for all of our disputes because we want to make sure that in the end of the day, our disputes are resolved mm -hmm. in a very effective and efficient ma manner. And if there is an opportunity to get it resolved without going to a full-blown arbitration, absolutely, I think we will always want to do that. And I think there is room for mediation to have a bigger role in international disputes as well. And we, we always try to do that as well. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, and uh, Michael. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me uh, to be a panelist. Um, you know, our, our setup is pretty much uh, similar to what Susanna just described. Uh, I am uh, head of litigation and arbitration for the entire company internationally. Uh, we have about 7,000 hotels worldwide. Um, what you should know in terms of how our company is structured is that uh, of those hotels, uh, the company owns very, very few. Uh, about 35% of our hotels we manage, about 65% of them we franchise. And so in each one of those cases, we have a management contract or a uh, franchise agreement with the owner of the hotel. And as a result of that, most of our litigation or arbitration arises out of the terms of those agreements. Uh, historically, what Marriott has done is that uh, in domestic cases, our uh, management uh, contracts or our franchise agreements would call for um, dispute resolution in appropriate courts in the U.S. Internationally, we would always do arbitration. <clears throat> Gradually, over the last several years, however, this is starting to transition where domestically we're writing into our contracts more and more uh, arbitration provisions. Uh, this is in large measure due to a couple of bad experiences we've had with uh, litigation in the US, uh, particularly out of uh, one or two courts in the US that are known within the US as judicial hell holes. Um, but you know, for the most part, that's the way we handle them through arbitration uh, internationally. Um, when we write our contracts, we write into the contract whether you know the terms of the arbitration, what the seat's going to be, which law applies, uh, really sort of all those preliminary things you need to know before you start an international arbitration. Um, we've had year to year, it varies as to how many we actually get involved with. Uh, last year, we actually had seven, which was a pretty high number for us. This year, we've had two or three. Um, and we're just working our way through them. Um, we have, my group covers pretty much everything uh, that could come up in litigation or arbitration with the exception of labor and employment work and tax work. We don't do any of that. We have other specialists within the law department who, who handle it. We actually are a company that's pretty, uh, it's, it's continentalized in the sense that we have a headquarters here in Bethesda, Maryland, right outside of Washington, DC, but we also have uh, legal offices uh, in uh, London, uh, Hong Kong, um, and various places around the world to cover various issues uh, in those continents. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's how we function. 
Great. Uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you all are coming from different places in terms of what your, what your businesses do. Um, and some differences in terms of, a, of an approach to arbitration, but you know, certainly uh, no surprise with international arbitration, there des there's a desire there, but to different levels. Um, uh, so if we can also talk about the arbitrator selection process, um, you know, many of the people uh, joining today uh, serve as arbitrators, um, other serve as outside counsel um, as well, uh, some do both, um, but your involvement in the arbitrator selection process um, is pretty critical. And so again, what we heard is that all of you are involved. You're significantly involved as a dispute is arising, hopefully trying to avoid a dispute. Frankly, from the ICDR's perspective, uh, the cases where in-house counsel are involved as opposed to simply handing off an arbitration to outside counsel, uh, it, it's a process that proceeds much more effectively. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, with regard to arbitration, sele arbitrator, sele arbitrator selection in particular though, can you each give us uh, your views and experiences in that process? Uh, so Susanna, I think we'll, we'll start this one off with you. Sure, thank you. So I think the, the first step in the arbitration selection process is to um, get consensus with the team, which includes your internal team and your outside counsel team uh, on the characteristics of, of the arbitrator you're looking for for this dispute, right? Like, so I always say, refuse that approach that like, oh, these are the usual suspects. No, why, why is this person right for this particular dispute? You know, each dispute is unique. Um, so we, we try to get alignment on the characteristics, and then we work with our outside counsel to get a preliminary list of, I don't know, five to ten names, right, that fit that profile. And then we try to narrow down. It's a very intense process, and we never rush that process because we always say that is, if not the most important decision in your arbitration, one of the most important ones. So uh, we take our time, you know, so we try to narrow down the list to like two or three that everybody feels like is, is the best person for the dispute. And when I say the best person, if it's your party appointed arbitrator, I mean, you are look, looking mainly, I think, someone who ob obviously is well regarded that will have the power to influence, you know, the, the chair and the other arbitrator that is a consensus builder. I think that is key. You know, we would never want to appoint someone who has strong views and will say it's either my opinion or, you know, I will dissent because we don't like dissenting opinions. We want to, you know, um, unanimous opinions. So we looked into all of this and also, you know, availability, which I think it's key. You know, you can have the best arbitrator out there, but if the person doesn't have uh, time to dedicate your case, then then it's not worth it. You know, you want to make sure there will be someone who will really spend the time trying to understand the case and, the, and read all the documents and all that. And, and that's why we, we have been pushing for newcomers and diversity and people who, um, who are not the, the usual suspects, but, um, but deserve a chance. They are ready, they deserve a chance and they will spend time. You know, we, the best experience we have had with arbitrators were appointing, um, you know, people who had the time and, and dedicated and didn't stretch themselves too thin and had time for the hearings and all that. Uh, so once we have, you know, two or three, I guess, you know, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, you know, if, if that is okay under the, the jurisdiction we are, um, we are uh, working with, then, you know, our outside counsel will probably just call the arbitrator and check availability, see, you know, are you are you available uh, to take another matter? And then, and then you know, we get to that one one person, and then we we make the appointment and hope that it will work out. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the process we follow. And then let me say for chair, um, what we are looking uh, for is just someone who who is strong and will keep a strong control over the proceedings because I think that is the key characteristic of a chair: someone who will be ready to make some tough decisions to keep the proceedings on track. Mm -hmm. 
Susanna, you've also mentioned in the past uh, the ICDR has a list process that's somewhat uh, somewhat unique, at least. Um, your views on that? Yeah, I think it's an excellent uh, process. We have had very good experiences using the ICDR list process. I think it's a very thoughtful process, and when we rely on the ICDR, we know that we are going to end up with with a good choice because of all the the thought, the thought that was put into that uh, list process and also like how much time you guys spend on trying to get to the right person. So yeah, we really like it. Even uh, in ad hoc arbitrations, we try to design a selection process that kind of mirrors you all's process because we think it's so good. The second code word, if I may interrupt, I do apologize. The second code word is November. Repeat, November. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. And I should also mention, um, you know, please do uh, uh, put your questions into the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen. We are going to have some time um, before we conclude to, to get to questions. So please, as they come to mind, uh, don't hesitate to, to present those and put them, type them in. All right. Um, thank you, Susanna. Um, Michael. Arbitrator selection, your involvement, how do you go about it? Sure. Um, well, I should have said when I was speaking earlier that uh, we do, uh, the people in my group tend to stay very actively involved in our cases. Obviously, uh, if, you know, there are all places around the world, we can't be uh, involved in uh, doing, you know, on the groundwork day to day, but we stay very involved in our cases to make sure that uh, they're moving in the right direction in terms of decisions we want to make and so forth. And so as a result, we work very closely with our counsel that we hire to handle these cases. And in terms of selecting an arbitrator for cases, um, I rely very heavily on our counsel. I ask them to uh, give me a list of uh, five to 10 names uh, and uh, if they could to rank, uh, you know, the top three or four of those in terms of their experience. And uh, from there, we'll go into a sort of a collaborative discussion of who we think, you know, what the pros and cons of each of those people are. And we'll ultimately um, reach a decision amongst ourselves about who we would like to pick as an arbitrator. Then we go through the process as Susanna described about, you know, making sure people are available, that sort of thing. The other thing I want to mention is that we very, we feel very strongly about diversity. So we work uh, hard to try and get uh, uh, diverse uh, people on these panels, particularly women, uh, because as you know, historically, there have not been as many uh, female arbitrators uh, as male arbitrators. And we're trying to do our part to change that. Um, so it's a collaborative effort. We work very closely with our outside counsel and uh, we try and come up with the best person that we think suits our needs in the particular case at issue. Thank you. Hi. Um, look, there's probably not much I can add to what Susanna and, and Michael have already been saying. So I would fully subscribe to, to you know, kind of their approach. And I think we, we pretty much do the same. Um, you know, and it, it's clear from what they were saying that, that we are very, very much involved in the process of arbitrator selection. It is, you know, probably the most important decision you take in an arbitration, so it makes sense for us to be involved. Uh, maybe kind of a small point to, to add, what we often look at is kind of what type, what style of arbitration do we want to have? And of course, that's the big divide between, you know, common law type arbitration versus civil law, you know, style type arbitration or kind of an international hybrid. I think in, in many of our cases, we lean much more towards a international type arbitration or common law type arbitration. So, you know, greater focus on documents, you know, less focus on, on witnesses, shorter hearings, you know, less discovery. And then of course you influence that a lot um, in, in terms of the, the arbitrators you, you select. So, so that's um, kind of, I guess, a, a small point to, to add to what was being said. And of course, diversity is, is an important key issue for us, which we you know, also take into account very much when selecting arbitrators. It's encouraging to hear about all the enthusiasm for diversity, frankly. Um, 
Uh, it's 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 no surprise. There's um, a huge effort that's taking place everywhere. But um, I would say five or ten years ago, when you would ask uh, about the arbitrator selection process, diversity might come up, uh, but it wouldn't be top of mind. And it's it's clear that it it's clear that it is now. Um, that is encouraging. Uh, moving on to mediation, so. Each of you, uh, I believe, at some point have already mentioned uh, mediation and um, using it and considering it. Uh, there's, again, a, a significant interest and push towards mediation. The Singapore Convention is part of that. Um, uh, its use is very uneven in our experience uh, around the world, but, but at the same time, quite developed and quite accepted in uh, certain places in certain countries. Uh, obviously, any organization with a dispute wants to resolve it in one way or another as quickly as inexpensively as possible with uh, as little disruption. Uh, a lot of you talked about continuing relationships with partners uh, uh, to your contracts. Um, and so many have talked about mediation being an important part of that as well. But, but your approaches towards mediation, uh, I think it would be helpful here too. Um, your approach towards mediation in conjunction with the arbitration process. Um, in other words, you're faced with, a, with an arbitration. Uh, what's the right time for mediation? Do you incorporate mediation provisions into your clauses themselves or not? Um, we've seen a little bit of an interesting trend uh, in that respect with regard to step clauses. Um, so, Michael, uh, do you want to uh, give us your thoughts, your views on mediation? Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting in, in thinking about this question, both uh, as you just phrased it and uh, when we met beforehand uh, about two weeks ago, I don't really have a coherent, <laughs> uniform answer to the question. I think with mediation, I would start by saying that uh, I am uh, always open to uh, doing mediation or, or to discussing ways that we can try and resolve our disputes. In fact, we go through that with our opposing uh, parties uh, almost uniformly before we ever get to the point where we're in litigation or arbitration. So we try as a business to resolve things before they get to that stage. Having said that, once we get into the stage uh, of litigation or arbitration, you know, whether mediation works or not, I, in my experience, is all over the map. Um, Sometimes it, it works early on, uh, although not as much. I think uh, if you've reached that stage and you've had discussions before you get into litigation or arbitration, you, the parties are often sort of set in their ways and don't seem to be able to get to uh, uh, a useful mediation until you're into the case somewhat, you know, through through some initial filings or discovery or whatever the situation is. And, and then mediation becomes important sort of as a last stage thing, I think, before you actually go into a trial or to an arbitration hearing. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of all over the place on, on mediation. I think it's a good thing. Sometimes we write it into our agreements. Sometimes we do not. Um, in my experience, it's been, <clears throat> It's been very useful at times and not so useful at other times. Uh, you know, it's, I don't think there's really any sort of consistent theme for me, but uh, as I said, I'm always open to having it. I think it's a good thing. Um, whether you write it into every um, agreement or into the rules of say the ICDR or something like that, I'm not sure I'm in favor of that. Uh, I think it should be encouraged, but I'm not sure it should be required. Um, so there you go. Okay, uh, Kai. So look, we are um, we we are a great supporter of mediation. I think it makes it makes a whole lot of sense. I, I guess if you take a step back, the the way we as a company approach dispute resolution is that we have a toolbox, right, to resolve disputes, and that includes negotiations it includes mediation and you know of course litigation arbitration and you know probably some other tools um, and we're very familiar with all of them and we expect really you know our outside counsel to be equally familiar with those tools and to be able to use them whenever they they, they make sense and i think this is where you know 
counsel very often is a step behind. They're very much an expert in arbitration, but you know, I have heard um, you know, a very well-known uh, arbitration specialists say, look, we don't do mediation, we don't, don't, we don't know what it is, we don't feel familiar, comfortable with it. And of course, from our perspective, that's wrong. You know, you need to, if you serve your client, you need to kind of mirror the toolbox the client has. And I, I think it's similar really also with institutions that if I go to an institution that offers dispute resolution services, I'd like them to have the same toolbox and be familiar with, you know, mediation, um, arbitration, you know, and, 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 and play with it. So I think that that's, that's very, very um, important. Um, and, and then if you go really into um, mediation, you start with step clauses uh, or, or dispute resolution clauses. My preference is, is a very simple um, dispute resolution clause, which has um, mediation followed by arbitration. And I would favor um, mandatory mediation um, simply because it's very, very difficult to get to mediation once you're in a dispute. Um, you know, it's difficult to agree on, on, on anything. So if you have it in the contract, you'll, you'll try it and then you'll see whether it works. At what point in time you go to mediation, I think that, you know, depends on the dispute. My experience is the earlier you do it, the better it is, because the longer you wait, the more entrenched parties become and the more difficult it is really to kind of go in, into a process like mediation. But then, you know, it depends a bit. Um, on the uh, on the um, on the type of dispute. So, look, in, in some we are great supporter of mediation. I think we'd love to see more in terms of mediation, and I think we'd we'd like to see council really being much much more uh, fluent and involved and, and and familiar with the mediation process. Kai, do you ever do uh, mediation? You, you said it's your preference um, that mediation be included as a part of the um, dispute resolution clause in the contract. Do you ever conduct mediations concurrently with an arbitration? Uh, in other words, you know, there does, there's a desire to move things along uh, and you don't want to hold up the mediation, or I should say, you don't want to hold up the arbitration process for the mediation and yet you still think it might be useful? Yeah. Has that ever been a practice of yours? Yeah, we, we do that. There are some cases where, where it makes sense, where, where you think, well, you know, it depends on the dynamic of the case, right? I mean, I, I you know, I remember cases where we have a, a strong interest to move the arbitration forward. Um, but of course, you also realize that if you're able to resolve it in a mediation, everyone is better off. So you try to build the mediation into the arbitration without kind of pausing it. So, so you know, that's possible and it makes sense in certain type of cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, Susanna. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I agree completely with all that uh, Michael and, and Kai said. Um, I would also like to see mediation being more uh, popular in the arbitration context, the international context. I agree, you know, often we hear from our arbitration council, oh, you know, we don't do mediation. Mediation is for, for domestic disputes, for litigation, you know. And I don't see a reason why, you know, that that should be the case. Um, in terms of the best timing, I mean, we'll always try to mediate upfront if we feel there is a chance of getting to an agreement. Sometimes the parties are so far apart that it would be a waste of time. Um, and then we try to get, you know, get going with the proceedings, the arbitration proceedings. And after, you know, you have gotten some leverage or, you know, you had some document production and you feel like the parties know more about the weaknesses and strengths of the case, then it's a, a better time to mediate, like maybe just before a hearing or something like that. Um, we try to avoid mandatory mediation clauses. I mean, it, we do tend to put some um, multi-step um, multi -step clauses into our contracts that include mediation, but, but it being an option. Uh, so to, as a reminder to the parties that that is available, but not necessarily required because, you know, sometimes, like I said, there's no room to mediate up front. 
And then we don't want to uh, have to wait, you know, 30 to 60 days for direct negotiations by senior executives and then mediation and then you start arbitration. Sometimes, you know, it's a waste of time and money. Uh, but we like as a reminder. And if that's not the case, then what I would encourage, you know, um, arbitral tribunals is that in the first session with the parties to discuss, you know, when should be a good uh, deadline, you know, for, for the parties to mediate, like, like judges do all the time. And just said, you know, the parties should try to mediate by X, definitely be way before a hearing. And as a reminder, so our outside counsel doesn't feel like, oh, if I raise mediation with the other side is a sign of weakness. You know, we don't like that type of discussion. I don't think trying to reach an amicable resolution is ever a sign of weakness, right? It should never be seen that way. But if you have in your uh, first session the schedule of the arbitration, then you can always use that as a hook. Hey, you know, we need to report back to the tribunal. So should we try? You know, it's a, it's a good thing. And honestly, it, it really uh, helps our outside counsel align their interests with our interests, right? I mean, sometimes when you get so close to the hearing for the outside counsel, it's like, you know, the hearings where outside firms really make their money. But, you know, obviously as in-house, we want to save money for the company. So it's a good reminder for our outside counsel, hey, you know, you, you really need to do that. And it's in the schedule. So we should try. So. So it, it is somewhat striking, uh, universal appeal for mediation, uh, but still, frankly, uh, a, a lot of desire to maintain control um, from in-house counsel, maintaining control with respect to perhaps a particular matter where it may be more useful than not, and certainly maintaining control in terms of timing and when it might be more beneficial or not, and um, um, so uh, again, interesting. And uh, at least institutionally, I would say that as part of every administrative conference at the outset of a case, we will raise the issue of mediation with the parties, uh, discussing with them um, their interest and the likelihood of a proceeding. Uh, our experience, again, at that point is that um, there's usually a polite, not right now, not in every case, uh, but um, in many cases, that's the response. But it, you know, where the parties eventually do mediate, um, it's been it's been obviously quite successful. And, and Eric, maybe just if I one comment here, what what I find, um, and that makes mediation so difficult or settlement discussions so difficult, is that and it, you know, I include myself as a party, a, a, a profound inability to understand the weakness of your own case. Um, so we go, all of us, right, we go into a dispute overestimating our strength and not seeing our weaknesses. Um, and of course, we try to mitigate that as much as possible, but we still do. And we all, when we discuss cases, right, we sit together, you know, in-house lawyer, outside lawyer, project director, and we all kind of reinforce our version of reality. And you can imagine that the other side is doing exactly the same. And, and then, you know, you try to cut to, to a, a mediation or settlement discussions and, you know, two di very different realities hit. And I think this is where we all, as lawyers, uh, we, we, as lawyers first, we are not trained to understand you know this dynamic we we think in positions right we think in legal rights but we don't have a good sense of you know this um uh, you know how do you the different realities that sometimes um meet in a dispute so i think there's a, there's a big learning curve for, for us in there then even if you as one party if you you know magically get to that point and you realize look you know there are different ways of looking at stuff of course, if, if you have a, a counterparty who is very entrenched in their position, again, you have a real struggle to get to mediate, to, to get to a settlement, a, 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 a real settlement discussion. So I think that's one of the real challenges we, we face in resolving disputes. And frankly, that's how we waste a lot of money in arbitrating or litigating cases which should settle if parties, both parties had a more realistic approach to you know, kind of the, the strength and weaknesses of their own cases. 
And, I may, and if I, I may, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> just wanted to give out the third CLE code word. The third CLE code word is arbitration. Repeat, arbitration. Thank you. Susanna. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something to what Kai uh, just said, because I also wondered, like, why is mediation um, used so much more frequently in the domestic context, right? When in the context of litigate, US litigation, for example, um, than arbitration. And I, I think one of the reasons is uh, because, you know, judges, state and federal judges, they really push for the parties to try to resolve the dispute in an amicable way. You know, like every judge, you know, I guess judges are now paid by the hour and um, they just wanted the parties to, to try to resolve it before they try the case. Um, so, you know, I do think there is room uh, for arbitrators to be more forceful in, in that sense. You know, obviously they wouldn't mediate themselves, but they would just push the parties. You know, I think an arbitrator that develops a reputation as someone who is business uh, minded and is really looking after the best interest of the parties. I mean, I think down the road, you're going to get a lot more appointments. Uh, you may not have your cases go all the way to the hearing, but I think you would get a lot more appointments because in the end of the day, that's what private parties are trying to achieve, you know, uh, finality, resolution, and then move on with their, their business. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are both excellent points. Uh, Kai's point about uh, overestimating your case, that's actually a study that was done on that uh, a couple of years ago. And in fact, it is... Uh, uh, well, at least according to the study, statistically correct uh, that every lawyer does overestimate the strength of their, their case and, and in some instances it's more than others. Um, but certainly uh, that's a benefit of the, of the mediation, mediation process. Um, this is of course New York Arbitration Week. And so um, one thing we wanna touch on is New York as a venue, and um, you know, as in-house counsel again from all over the all over the world, uh, New York it comes up. It comes up in terms of a potential venue uh, for your international arbitrations. And um, you know, what are your perspectives about New York? Why why is it a uh, a place where you know partners are are being drawn internationally? Um, I will actually tie in a question here also with regard to uh, that, that I, I see has come in. Um, and that is, um, you know, in, in, when you find that you might be in the United States uh, with respect to a particular dispute, you know, do you, do you prefer arbitration uh, or would you rather litigate? So I guess one is a New York specific question. Uh, the other is a more general U.S. jurisdictional question. Um, we'll start uh, with uh, Michael on this one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, as I said earlier, when I was describing our company, uh, you know, historically, we wanted our disputes uh, domestically in the U.S. to be um, uh, litigation versus arbitration. So, <clears throat> you know, in terms of actually doing arbitrations uh, in New York, we haven't had a whole lot of experience on that. On the litigation side, it's New York's been a traditional place where we've actually, a lot of our contracts apply New York law and call for resolution in New York courts, in particular because there is in Manhattan a specialized uh, business court that uh, the commercial division that handles a lot of these type of disputes uh, involving major corporations. And our experience in that court has actually been pretty good. Uh, the judges are sophisticated. They make uh, reasoned decisions for the most part. Uh, they're fairly uh, attentive and relatively quick in terms of, uh, of litigation. And so I, I actually like that venue as a general rule. Uh, we got one decision from them early on in my tenure at Marriott. I've been here nine and a half years, 
probably about eight years ago, which was not favorable. We were very worried about it, but as it's turned out, it hasn't affected us as adversely as we all thought it would. And so we've learned to live with it and it's not that bad. So I would say, you know, in terms of New York courts, it's fine. In terms of New York arbitration, um, I, I don't have a problem with it, uh, with doing an arbitration in New York either. I mean, you know, sometimes you hear about, oh, it's very expensive and, you know, but so is Geneva and London and, you know, all these other places you can do uh, arbitrations. Um, so I, I think it's fine, uh, but I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen and, you know, I, I sort of have my perspective on that. I don't know how people from outside the United States feel about New York. Yeah. Susanna? Yeah, I think in the US, I agree. If, we, if you have a contract governed by New York law, sure, absolutely. I think New York is a great option. Sometimes we have a little bit of difficulty finding um, a hearing facility that it's large enough for, for large, large hearings in New York. And also, you know, hotels are pretty expensive. But as Michael said, you know, all the places that usually go to for arbitration hearings are expensive. So, um, so yeah, and the courts are experienced. So I think it's a it's a great option. You know, I think New York is a is a really great option in the U.S. And as to the question, uh, litigating in the United States. Yeah. So so like I said, I think um, we uh, for domestic disputes, if um, it, you know, we we think long and hard about arbitration. You know, we usually default to uh, litigation unless there's something particular about the contract is very, um, you know, high amounts at stake, or it's a party that we have a long standing relationship with that we wouldn't want to be in court uh, facing that party or some confidentiality concerns. But, you know, um, sometimes, you know, just litigation will, will do the trick and it's fine. Uh, for international disputes, definitely uh, arbitration is our first choice. All right. Hi. <laughs> so look, I, I guess I'm the one, you know, who, who um, you know, sits outside New York. I guess the way I would look at it is that, um, you know, you have an arbitration in New York, you, you get great arbitrator, um, same for, for New York courts, I'm, I'm, I'm so sure of courts in the US, you get, you know, you have high quality let's take a New York arbitration and, and, and think about it more in current terms of a domestic US arbitration. High quality, good lawyers, good arbitrators, no, no doubt about it. If I compare that, let's say with, let's take Geneva, an ICC arbitration, well, not ICC, just any arbitration <laughs> in Geneva. Equally, you know, no doubt that you have great arbitrator, great results, you know, no, no quality issue. If I look at the cost, if I compare a New York arbitration with a so a, a domestic U.S. arbitration based in New York with a um, international arbitration in Geneva or more a continental type arbitration in Geneva, the U.S. the New York arbitration will be significantly more expensive. Quality will be the same, um, and that's what I mentioned earlier in terms of the. The style of arbitration you get, right? It is just more expensive doing arbitration in New York, given you know you have may have depositions, you, you have larger number of witnesses, you have a longer hearing, all of that you have uh, a signif potentially significantly more uh, document discovery. All of that, you know, would point me to say, look, I favor a arbitration that is outside the U.S. for cost reasons. Quality being equal, cost being best, better, I think, if you go for a uh, civil law type arbitration. Uh, yeah, of, of course, you can have a civil law type arbitration in New York. Of course. And you, and you, and you did mention that, that that's your preference. You know, you, you want, you'll, you'll select your arbitrators uh, with the hope of ensuring that. Um, yeah. I, so I think it goes without saying, but, you know, the question also about litigating U.S. courts, I assume... That is even uh, that that's uh, much further down the list in terms of your pre preferences, correct? That, that's correct. You know, I think it, it really boils down to cost. And and as you say, you know, clearly, if you do an arbitration in New York, uh, it doesn't need to be a, a domestic U.S. arbitration. That's clear. 
you know, and, and the seed, um, the seed has some influence in terms of what type of arbitration you, you see, but obviously you could also do a very international arbitration, a continental type civil type arbitration, New York, no, 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 no question, right? So it's just, it gives you a certain tendency if you base your arbitration in, in New York. And by the way, I would say the same about London, right? And I, I, I live um, and, and work in London. Um, that you also have, you know, the, the typical, you know, London domestic uh, English type arbitration is probably not something that, that I would, um, you know, subscribe to for, for most of our cases. Mm -hmm. um, Kai, you've mentioned the seat, and I'm just recalling, uh, it, it sticks out in my mind, uh, Susanna, uh, in a prior discussion, we were talking about how much you'll fight for the seat uh, more than just about anything. Uh, that's perhaps a slight exaggeration, but can you elaborate just a bit on that or share your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, the, the choice of the seat is so important because, you know, as you all know, the, the courts of that seat will, will have supervising jurisdiction over their arbitration. So I think that that decision cannot be underestimated, um, and we will absolutely will fight more for the for the right seat than anything else in an arbitration clause. So that is that is a critical uh, thing for us. The applicable law, I think, you know, uh, when you have a, a truly international tribunal, regardless of the applicable law, you know, there'll be some element of equity and international you know general principles of law and all that so that doesn't worry me that much um but the seat is crucial okay uh, i'm gonna present one more question we really have quite a number of good excellent questions that have come in from the audience as well so uh, we'll turn to that but um, let's just touch on uh, covid and the current environment and um uh, you know, Michael was talking earlier, in terms of the number of disputes that have arisen sort of this year, it sounded like it was not substantial. And so it might be the businesses are simply really trying to avoid uh, um, uh, really inflaming disputes that might result because of the current environment. Um, but uh, if you could just give your thoughts on, on where we are, virtual hearings, um, are you interested? Do you want to wait it out until people can get back together again? Uh, I'll share our own experiences in the ICDR, uh, but I want to give uh, each of you an opportunity to at least weigh in on how this has impacted things in the immediate term and in the, uh, let's say, the uh, immediate future term. Susanna? Yes, so our experience with COVID related disputes is that we saw a lot of force majeure notices being exchanged early on in the when the pandemic started, but we haven't seen those turning to disputes and I think it's a it's a good thing. I mean, obviously parties are reserving their rights and trying to figure out like is there a good practical commercial way of resolving things without, you know, turning this COVID thing into a much bigger problem right for the company. Uh, in terms of vi virtual proceedings, um, we are all for it because, you know, we are all trying to find a creative way to continue to do our business. And um, so I think, you know, putting off hearings because we cannot be together in person is a mistake. So, I mean, in most cases, th there may be exceptions, but uh, I think generally, um, you know, virtual hearings may not be perfect, but they work. And uh you should try, you know, to move on rather than put your whole uh, life and in, in the your company's business on hold until things get better, which we don't know when will be. Yeah, yeah. Kai, are you going virtual? We're going virtual, yeah. <laughs> so look, I, I mean, um, uh, you know, I think that's probably the one positive thing about COVID that it's really kind of a a leap forward in terms of you know, how we, how we integrate technology into arbitration. Um, I think the last, what, six to nine months have shown that, um, you know, virtual hearings are possible. Um, clearly, you know, case management hearings or hearings on procedural points, but I think also main hearings, 
that you know with the right technology um, you, you can do it and I think that's really something it's, it's a great development and something that we can take from you know what we are learning now in, into the future into the post-COVID future and and it will allow us to be much more flexible in terms of conducting hearings you know we, we were talking a little bit about um, the role tribunals can play in, in settlement discussions right um, you can easily you know arrange a one day virtual hearing where everyone is, is is in one room one virtual room and have a discussion on the case while previously you know you'd have the addition of having to fly people into places so i think you know what we are learning now what we're trying now in terms of virtual hearing will allow us um, to have much more flexibility in, in in the future in terms of how we arrange hearings and how we make use um, you know, of, of the of the technology we have for arbitration. Yeah. Michael, how are you all doing in the COVID environment? Need to unmute. Sorry, sorry that I, yeah. So um, we're doing fine. We, um, I, I think an interesting byproduct as, uh, as uh, Kai just said of, of COVID is that, uh, you know, it's changed a number of things in interesting ways. And I think actually we've had fewer disputes this year because of COVID. I think it has forced the parties to uh, try and resolve things faster and on business, better business terms, quicker business terms. And I think that's had some effect. The, um, uh, the arbitrations we've had this year have actually been matters that got started before COVID. So what we've done, they've been virtual, but they have, uh, they're matters that started earlier and we've continued on with them, gone ahead and done them virtually and it's been fine. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting experience with it. Um, uh, I actually, uh, I'm sure many of the um, attendees on this, on this uh, presentation, uh, many of the participants, and maybe some of you guys all know uh, uh, a woman named uh, Sama Haridi, who uh, is both a practitioner and uh, has been an arbitrator. And I actually did a program with her recently uh, for a group I'm part of. I invited her to come speak, and she talked a lot about all the innovations that various uh, arbitration groups are doing to try and deal with uh, hearings uh, in COVID. And I think that. Uh, It'll be interesting to see going forward once COVID is behind us, uh, how much of that continues or whether we go back to the old ways of being physically present for everything. Um, I, I actually miss being physically present for some of these things. It's, it's great, but uh, you know, I can see the clear benefit uh, as, you know, as Kai described of uh, doing these things virtually and how, how much better we are at doing it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the ICDR, uh, I would say, looking back on last February and March, um, you know, the technology that it takes to conduct a virtual hearing has been in existence for, for a long time. Uh, uh, but, but the adoption rate, frankly, by the legal community has been quite slow, the, the arbitration community quite slow. We've had cameras in our hearing rooms, I can't tell you how long, uh, waiting for the, for the day where parties and lawyers would be interested and willing to have their uh, arbitrations proceed remotely. So that is perhaps one of the benefits. And, um, it, but in terms of act hearings actually taking place, I would say there's been a, uh, uh, there's certainly adoption now. People are proceeding online, but it, it took a few months. It took a few months before people would realize, parties would realize uh, that if they weren't gonna do it virtually, it simply was not gonna happen for quite some time. Um, so at this point, Lewis, uh, if you could uh, uh, maybe introduce a, a few of the questions we've been tracking uh, that have come in from the attendees. Thanks, Eric. Okay, we have quite a number. Um, I'll throw one out um, regarding again, arbitrator selection seems to be an area of great interest. I'll open it up to any of the panelists. Do you prefer arbitrators with judicial experience such as retired judges or do you look for industry specialists? Um, I'll go first. 
I, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I'm looking for people that are uh, competent and that have good reputations that have done, you know, people have liked their work in the past. Um, to be honest, and I have a few friends that are judges, uh, you know, sometimes they're not always the best uh, because they have this feeling like they need to run things the way they've run things in their courtroom. And uh, that's a little bit of a different dynamic in arbitration. So uh, that, you know, if, if it's a former judge, I look at it a little more closely. Um, I think arbitration practitioners who are going to be fair uh, are my preferred group of candidates. And, um, you know, again, uh, you know, I, I, we look at all these different things when we're making the decision and trying to decide who, who we might select. Thank you. Susanna, Kai? I, I agree. I think it depends on the dispute, but I tend to prefer the practitioners with industry experience. But again, it depends on the dispute. Actually, Lewis, there was one, one question I saw that kind of relates to this a little bit. And it was, it was, do you choose, do you want specialized arbitrators for more complex uh, focused litigation or something along those lines? And my reaction to that is uh, very possibly, you know, if you get something that's very complicated or in a specific area, let's say it's an environmental dispute or uh, something in the hospitality industry, you know, I'm interested in looking at uh, potential arbitrators who have some experience in that area because it could be helpful. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that, that's often a factor that's key in making the decision who you select as well. Thank you. Kai? Uh, look, I think it, it, it is really what was being said. I mean, um, that there, you know, very often we want to have international arbitration uh, for, for a number of reasons. And of course, if you then uh, would select a, a judge, depending really on the individual person, but if you take the cliche, right, then um, you run the risk of, um, you know, having an arbitration, which is essentially copycat of, of the domestic litigation, which is exactly what you want to avoid. So very often, I think you would go uh, more for the international arbitrator. But, you know, as it was being said, it depends very much on the individual case. Okay, thank you. I have a question submitted regarding costs. And again, it's directed to the entire panel. To what extent do you record and calculate the time and work effort that your legal department and other key people within the company devote to supporting an arbitration process with the view of seeking to recover those costs in an arbitration? I, I can't respond quickly. We do. Sorry, it's the question. <laughs> Am I too quick? <laughs> no, 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 please. So we do record the time and, um, you know, we ask for, um, you know, compensation and we've been successful in, in a number of cases. Anyone else, Susanna? One of the, uh, yeah, and for those that worked in firms, uh, one of the one of the dreaded aspects of, is, is collecting, reporting all your time. Uh, most people going in house think that they've been absolved of that. Kai is indicating otherwise. Um, but I don't know that it's a universal practice. It, it, you know, but you've recovered your costs. It's, uh, it, it's, is that primarily the reason? Or you're also trying to uh, just account for your time, okay? No, I mean, in, in, in my case, in the legal department, that's primarily the reason. Um, but what you also have for project managers, project directors, you know, they record their time um, um, also for, you know, for accounting purposes in terms of the cost of the project, yeah. I was laughing, Eric, because I agree with you. You know, it, it was so nice to go in-house and not to have to worry about keeping your time. Uh, certainly we can maintain, we can keep track of our costs because there are things that you pay for that are specific cost items you'll have receipts for and so forth. But keeping track of time for what in-house people are doing is a little more difficult. And uh, I would say as a general rule, we don't do that. Um, you know, maybe we should. <laughs> Giving, given uh, the cost awards, but, uh, but that's where we are right now, at least. Okay, uh, let me give the Susanna, next- were you gonna, Sorry, were you, did you have something to add, Susanna? I, I wasn't sure. 
Oh, yeah, okay. I think we are more, um, we have a, a process to keep track of our costs mm -hmm. for, for internal purposes. And I think it's a case by case on whether we bring that yeah. situation. All right, thank you. Uh, the next key uh, CLE code word is drafting. I repeat, the word is drafting. And we have another question uh, for, again, all the panelists. Do the panelists use any kind of formal early case assessment process when a dispute looks like it might be headed to mediation, arbitration, or litigation? And actually, if I, if I might, uh, there's a few questions along the same theme. Um, there's the early evaluation, you know, do you, do you engage in that? Is it a formal process? Um, dispute resolution boards also, you know, do you, do you bring those in? Do you anticipate? Maybe that's Kai more a question for you considering uh, you've got more of a construction heavy um, uh, caseload. Um, so I just wanted to add that little detail to the question. For all processes, early case evaluation, DRBs. Yeah, I, I, I'll, yeah sorry, uh, I'll let, I'll let. Okay, so, uh, so we, we do um, early case assessments, um, you know, as um, just uh, as a matter of routine um, in, in, in most, uh, it, well, in, in the vast majority of cases, just where it makes sense. I should add, you know, given that I'm doing a lot of construction, um, what we also, what I sometimes find even more helpful is to have a kind of a, a delay disruption, this type of expert coming into the case so that the person who would later be the, the expert witness and give you a assessment of the case because ultimately, you know, most construction cases are fact driven and the lawyers tend to give you an assessment based on the assumption that what they've heard from the project manager is correct, but you really need to know the facts. So sometimes the early case assessment is more kind of the expertise of a, um, you know, an engineer who does, who, who does your, your delay analysis. Um, the second part of your question, dispute boards. Um, you know, I, I've seen, I've heard a lot of talk about dispute boards for, for many, many years. Um, I must admit, I haven't seen them um, in that many cases. I've seen it in, in many contracts, but then when it comes to actually investing the money to have a you know, standing dispute board, you very often see that people are a bit more reluctant. Or I had cases where the customer, you know, at the point in time when we asked for the dispute board to be established, realized that there's a cost involved, a monthly cost and kind of withdrew from it. So, you know, I'm, um, I think the idea of dispute boards, it's great. It may be similar to, to mediation. I, I frankly, I haven't seen that many dispute boards in, in action. Susanna? Yes, so we also have a very robust early evaluation process under our litigation management process. And um, not so much for like litigation arbitration because you know, the, the contractual selection has been made when the contract was negotiated, right? So um, we'll, we will know, but that the early evaluation will inform and rather we should pursue that arbitration or litigation or we sh if we should try to settle early on, you know, what is in the best interest of the company in terms of the cost that will be involved, our chances of success and all that. And I think that is critical to do that um, evaluation strategy discussion early on. Is that evaluation done? You talked about much of the work early in a case being done in house. Is the early case evaluation, is that an in the process is done in house? Do you engage outside counsel to explore weaknesses or strengths? Outside counsel is definitely involved, but, uh, but we drive this internal, like the, the internal team drives the process because, I mean, one common. I would say mistake uh, made by outside counsel is that they feel especially like early on that they need to be like, you know, an advocate for the case rather than give you an objective assessment. And what I'm looking for is an objective mm. assessment of the risk, not like, oh, you're going to win for sure and let's pursue this. I mean, that's not what we need. So, 
So then we rely more on our internal experience, our you know instincts and all that. But we consult outside counsel for sure. Yeah, we uh, we set up actually a couple of years ago a mock arbitration process for this exact purpose. A uh, number of parties indicated that you know they really valued sort of getting a truly objective view from somebody that might be serving as an arbitrator. It's not quite the same as early case assessment um, or evaluation. Um, you know, some takers, but uh, you know, not not a huge number. Um, does anybody? Uh, there's again a lot of mediation related questions. Uh, anybody want to weigh in with their? estimated success rate actually settling mediations where they do go forward. What percentage of your cases settle? Um, I'll take this one. I, I don't know if I can put a percentage on it, but uh, maybe somewhere between a third and a half, you know, maybe more. It's hard to say because uh, like I said, we really work hard to get things resolved before they get to arbitration uh, or litigation. Uh, and, you know, there have been some cases where we get into full blown litigation arbitration and fight for, you know, months and months and months. And you'd think the case would never settle when it does. Um, you know, so sometimes you just have to sort of play those things out a, a bit. Um, but yeah, a, a substantial portion of our matters do ultimately settle. Kai, you were up to weigh in? Yeah, look, I, I, I don't have any statistics, um, but kind of uh, looking at, at our cases, I think it's clearly uh, above 50% uh, case, cases settle. Um, I've observed it more often than not that we don't settle um, on the day of the mediation, but that the mediation triggered a process that continues after the mediation day. And then in, in that process, we, we ultimately settle. Mm -hmm. So my, yeah, sorry, please. Yeah, I, I was going to say my answer will be a little different because I would say 100% of cases settle one way or another, because uh, even if after the hearing, even if after the war, because it's not economical for us to be pursuing even collection endlessly, you know, so eventually the parties will come to the table when you find a resolution It's very, very rare, I would say. In, in at least in for my company that um, you know we don't don't settle go through a hearing you get an award and then you collect that whole award right we I mean even like the collection effort is an exercise of bringing the other side to the table so good question Thank um, I, I just have one additional question. As you know, the AAA ICDR is very sensitive to what our users tell us. We have exit surveys that we receive from the clients and the focus still continues to be on time and costs. And we've introduced over the years a number of process efficiencies, expedited rules, emergency arbitrators, uh, some ways to save money regarding arbitrators compensation. I'm wondering if each of you have any advice or views uh, you'd like to share with us regarding additional ways the institutions can look at improving their uh, arbitration mechanisms. I can think about it again. <laughs> um, I think the, the institutions are, are doing their part. I think, um, I think the only thing I would say is, um, you know, spend the time training your arbitrators. And I think the, the AAA and CTR, the, they do an excellent job on that, you know, providing the right training because things get derailed when you don't have the right tribunal. Um, and I think, you know, time and costs are, are so important, right? But you also want to get it right. And again, it goes back to having the right tribunal and experienced tribunal, not necessarily experienced like because each arbitrator has had a hundred disputes, not, not like that, but just people who know what they're doing or they can resort to the institution if they have a question and the institution will help them out. Thank you. Michael, Kai, any additional observations? Maybe, and, and, and I must admit, I don't know how much, um, you know, AAA, ICDR are doing in, in terms of um, 
you know, promoting mediation and from, you know, the discussion today, I have a sense that you're doing quite a bit already and having it part of, of um, you know, kind of your um, discussions with the parties. I think that's, that's an important element. Um, you know, the, the observation that mediation is out there, everyone likes it, but it's not happening. You know, that's been uh, the discussion we've been having for I don't know how many years now. Um, and I think it is, I wouldn't give up on it. I think we need to push this further. And I think this is still something where I think the institutions, um, you know, need to really mirror much more what, um, what, what the parties want and the parties need to learn as well. Um, and, and I think the institution can play a role here in just, you know, putting mediation on equal footing to, to arbitration. I think, I know it's difficult simply from a financial perspective because there's more, more, more money in arbitration than there is in mediation. But from a client perspective, I think that that's very important. And then add to that really educating people on mediation advocacy. Mediation is something different than running an arbitration and people need to understand that. We need for mediation to work. I think we need counsel on board. You need the lawyers that represent companies, you know, fully supporting mediation. I think institutions can play a role in really educating um, lawyers in, in mediation advocacy and putting it more into the, the forefront. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I really don't have much to add to that. I think, uh, you know, everything Susanna and Kai have said is exactly right. Um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, you continue doing programs like this because I think it is very helpful um, uh, to hear people's perspectives and to, uh, you know, focus on uh, some of the issues that have been raised by the people that have asked the questions. So uh, I, I think keep up, uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael. Okay, let me give the last word before I turn it over to Eric. The last CLE word for today's program is virtual. Repeat, virtual. Thank you. Eric? Well, thank you very much. Um, an excellent discussion and really very helpful, I think, to everybody that works, of course, in the field. Uh, Kai, Susanna, Michael, uh, we appreciate your, your time and contribution today. Uh, that does wrap up the program. We're at the end of our time. Uh, and thank you again to all the New York Arbitration Week organizers. We look forward to seeing you next year, if not before. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.